Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today we are joined by Chad Holmes, Security Evangelist at Scenario, and Tim Bloomer, Director of Sales Engineering at Scenario. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Scenario. Scenario has one simple goal to secure every IoT, IOMT, OT, and IT device in healthcare environments with capabilities ranging from micro segmentation and improved device insight to identifying exposed EPHI and stopping ransomware. Scenario protects hospitals from a variety of modern cyber attacks. To learn more about Scenario at scenario.com or follow them on X at Scenario and and LinkedIn. Now, just a quick reminder about our spring MD Expo. We're headed to the M Resort Spa Casino in Las Vegas next month. So that's April 7th to the 9th. So please join us for three days of education, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology products and services. Registration is still open. So for more details, please visit mdexposhow.com. Also, please mark your calendars for our HTM Mixer, which is being held at the Westin Indianapolis from May the 2nd and 3rd. Now, our mixers are a slightly modified, smaller, shorter duration and less crowded event that still provides valuable continuing education, networking and, of course, vendor engagement opportunities. So for more information and registration details, please visit htmmixer.com. I also like to announce that Technation Magazine is excited to announce that we are taking applications for our third annual 40 under 40 powered by YP and MD. We are looking for HDM professionals who are under the age of 40 who have done amazing work for the biomedical industry. Applications are due by April the 26th, so please apply at onetechnation.com or see the flyer in the handout section of your dashboard. Okay, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI, and you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our Webinar Wednesday 10th anniversary prizes. Today's prize is, again, a pair of Apple AirPods, second generation. So using the questions feature on your dashboard, let me know the answer to the following trivia question. Now, Easter is almost upon us. So what flower is associated with Easter? I'll reveal the answer and our winner at the end of the webinar. We'll be wrapping up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit your questions anytime using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presenters today are Chad Holmes and Tim Bloomer. So Chad and Tim, you may begin whenever you're ready. Great, thank you as always, Linda. I'm really excited to present today. Uh, by the way, my wife is studying for a horticulture degree, so if anyone wants to call her about that flower question, feel free to, you can probably also Google it. Anyway, looking forward to seeing those answers. More importantly, today we are going to talk about identifying exposed EPHI, and most importantly about that topic, finding patient data before the hackers do. Um, with me today, I have Tim Bloomer. Tim is our Director of Sales Engineering. Tim, give a big wave, please. Um, Tim's gonna be talking Hi, through, <laughs> thanks Tim. Tim's gonna be talking through a little bit of our product later on as we go and jumping in to answer questions uh, as we go along. Um, and my name is Chad Holmes. I'm a security evangelist at Scenario. Um, I think this is like my 12th webinar with Tech Nation Webinar Wednesday. So you all aren't getting sick of me yet, which I really appreciate um, and would love to hear any feedback about what's going well with the webinars we've been doing or where we can improve them. More importantly, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today. The first thing we're gonna do is talk about the state of patient data security. And as many of you know, I always like to talk about what the problem is and why it is before we talk about solutions. Because if we talk about solutions to a problem without defining what we're actually trying to resolve, um, it can get really confusing really quickly. So we'll talk a little bit about the state of patient data security. We'll also talk about why we're under attack, what factors are driving the widespread attacks we're seeing on healthcare. From there, we'll dive a little deeper into the topic at hand, and we'll start talking about common exposure points in healthcare. We'll talk about how data is transferred, why it's transferred, and why hackers are so easily uh, able to get into those systems. From there, we'll, we'll get a little prescriptive. We'll start talking about improving protections around those systems. And then Tim will give you a patient data security walkthrough. This is one of our newer products based on about two years of research that we've been doing. 
At the very end, we'll also be giving you some bonus, bonus guidance around the recent HPH cybersecurity performance goals. Um, these were launched a couple months ago and are so valuable. I wanna make sure we wedge those into every webinar we do because we frequently hear people say, we're investing a lot in cybersecurity for our hospital. We're not sure where else to go, help us. These goals do exactly that. So we'll take a little detour at the end. And of course, we will answer questions both at the end and as we go through. So if you have a question as we're going through, feel free to type in that question or chat box. I'll do my best to get to it in real time. If we don't, we'll make sure to answer them at the end of the webinar. Please do not be bashful there. So jumping right into this, let's talk a little bit about the state of patient data security. When we look at the entire industry, we start to realize that cyber attacks are an ongoing consistent threat to healthcare. Um, in the US, a hospital is hit by a cyber attack every 7.1 minutes. Now to be crystal clear, that doesn't necessarily mean that every attack is successful, but when you have that volume of attacks, you're going to see successful attacks and you're gonna see data breaches, ransomware attacks, et cetera. To put that in perspective, there's gonna be between eight and nine different cyber attacks in hospitals by the time we wrap up today. Multiply that by 24 hours, then multiply that by a week and keep going and going, and you'll see this is a very, very clear focus for hackers. And it's such a focus that is actually the top uh, uh, targeted industry in the US in terms of critical infrastructure. 24% of ransomware attacks reported by the FBI in 2022 targeted healthcare. My guess is when the 2023 numbers come out in the near future, that number is gonna be even, even higher. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through. Their data breach attacks are more regulated in healthcare, so we know the exact numbers there. For other industries, we don't quite know that, but we can safely say that this is the top targeted industry um, in the US. We also know that since 2009, um, there have been reporting regulations in place which require a data breach to be reported. So it's not just ransomware attacks, but data breaches as well. And in that 15 year span, there have been over 3000 reported hacking and IT instances that expose patient data, which is just a horrific number until we see the next one, which is even worse. There's been over half a billion with a B um, patient records that have exposed since we began tracking that data in 2009. You know, put it in perspective, that's one and a half times, you know, the average American has had their patient records exposed. Um, you know, I like to talk about this. It's also about one in three people had their data exposed last year alone. I'm the one in the three on this call that's spoken already because my data was exposed during an attack on Christmas Eve at a hospital in Northern Massachusetts. So at the end of the day, most of the people on this call will have had their data exposed at some point. And then finally, we do know that there's a lot of costs associated with it, these attacks. Believe it or not, the fines are the lowest level costs. And we'll dive into this in a little bit. There have been $138 million in fines paid uh, um, for data breaches on healthcare environments since 2003. That is gonna be a drop in the bucket compared to this next slide, where we look deeper into the state of healthcare cybersecurity. Because we can't just talk about the fines and the records, we have to understand how focused these, these attacks are. And I would not be a good fear monger if I did not lead off with Change Healthcare here, right? If you're not familiar, Change Healthcare um, processes payments for uh, hospitals. They have an ongoing ransomware outage. They're in the process of recovering from it in a variety of different ways. It appears that Change has paid a $22 million ransom to help expedite the recovery process. The cascading cost has been up to $100 million per day per provider. Um, I saw a stat earlier that I couldn't get on the slide, but earlier today it was reported that there are 14 billion, again with a B, uh, uh, ch in charges waiting to be processed. That's every doctor, small hospital, clinic, et cetera. There's $14 billion in revenue that they are not able to access. And while we'd like to think of our, our healthcare system as focused on healthcare, the reality is we live in a commercial environment where they need that money to keep their doors open. And so we're starting to see very, very uh, um, direct impact on patient care because they cannot get the money to help care for them. The estimated real costs, again, when I made this slide, were between 250 and 2 billion. That has been blown out of the water. It's gonna be in the double digits of billions, if not more. The problem is this is not the only attack. This is just the most recent attack. If we look deeper, there are a huge number of hospitals that have been hit and have released the stats around what it costs when they get hit. Now, I really wanna be clear here. I'm not picking on Change Healthcare. I'm not picking on University of Vermont or others. I'm actually applauding them because they have 
opened up uh, um, their information and shared what the cost of a data breach is, what the cost of a hack is. In University of Vermont's case, their executive team has actually been traveling around for almost two years telling everyone what happened and how they could stop it and why it cost them $63 million. So at the end of the day, we have to go and we have to look at these attacks and realize we are being attacked. We are seeing hackers get a lot of revenue from these attacks. And the more information we share, despite that being very, very difficult, the better it's going to be for everyone. Now, the one thing I do have to point out is the very bottom hospital there, because this is what's really at risk. Yes, it really stinks to have outages. It stinks to have deferred patient care and it stinks to lose money. But at the end of the day, we also have hospitals like St. Margaret's in Southern Illinois, which is a rural facility uh, um, that was serving an under, underserved community. They got hit by a ransomware attack. That combined with a few other things allow, uh, ultimately resulted in them having to close their doors. You know, effectively, the caregivers there did an outstanding job of providing care throughout the cyber attack. But at the end of the day, they could not accurately keep records that would allow for billing to insurance companies and Medicare, et cetera. And they had to close their doors because of that. And that's the truth to the U.S. healthcare system is us losing um, healthcare providers throughout the country because of these cyber attacks. And so if, if we look more into the data that we're going to be talking about today, I mentioned it earlier, there were about 118 million records exposed last year from hacking and IT incidents. One in three people, again, a third of Americans have had their data exposed in some way in the last year alone. And we also know that when this data is exposed or when there are cyber attacks, I should say, that we see direct impact on patients. A cyber, cyber attacks traditionally result in higher mortality rates in between 20 and 30% of hospitals. We measure it at 24%, others measure in different ways. But the reality is because of the impacted care that these cyber attacks have, we'd see direct impact on patient care. And, and that's really, really dangerous. So it's up to all of us to figure out how we better can better secure our environment, secure our data, and help protect patients at the end of the day. And of course, if you want any references uh, uh, for these, please shoot me an email. Um, you'll see my email at the end of the, the session today. I'm happy to pass these along. These are all well-documented cases. And so the question has to be, are things getting better? Um, and if we look at the, uh, at the numbers, in 2022, we had some pretty rough numbers. There were 43 million patient records exposed, 550 data breaches, an estimated 800 or so hospitals got hit by ransomware attacks, and the five-year uh, growth on data breaches was staggering. There were a 270% increase in events and over a 1,300% increase in number of records exposed. Now, you've already seen some of the stats in 2023, and we absolutely are not getting better. The number of patient records exposed over the last year has almost tripled. Uh, the number of data breaches has stayed the same, but they've gotten much, much more efficient. So while, while they've only seen an increase in two data breaches, they've more than tripled their efficiency in getting data out during those breaches. Effectively, the market is speaking, and we're seeing that hackers are realizing if they sit in environments longer, collect more data, they can make more money that way. We still don't know the ransomware stats for last year, but you know it wouldn't be a surprise if it was over a thousand attacks. And there's roughly 89% of hospitals that have been attacked in the last couple of years. Now, I will say those 11% of hospitals that were not attacked were probably actually attacked and just don't know it yet. So it, it's, it's clear that hospitals are a target. We have to start finding a way to help them secure their environments. And to understand why we're under attack, we have to look at the different factors that drive um, adoption of cybersecurity protections in healthcare environments. And these happen to be at three different levels. First is the industry as a whole has historically underinvested in our protections. If you compare us to industries like the commercial space or the banking space, they can all go and put dollar amounts on hacks and understand how much they have to invest to protect against those. In healthcare, we don't do that. In healthcare, we see a bunch of new IV pumps that can be put online really quickly and report data more quickly, and we embrace them because they improve patient care. That's outstanding. We want to keep encouraging that. But that also means that we put new entry points and attack vectors on the network without thinking how to secure them. And after you do that for 10 or 15 years, you start to see very insecure environments, which is exactly where we are today. We also know that motivations are not exactly right. You know, people are motivated to stay off the wall of shame, um, which reports all, a lot of the stats that I just reported on. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're taking the right steps. They're just taking the steps to keep them off the wall of shame, not necessarily protect their environments or, or their patients. And then finally, at the industry level, we see a recovery conundrum, right? Just under half the time, we're seeing people actually pay the ransom just like Change Healthcare did. 
the thought is you should never pay a ransom, but you should always be prepared to do so because sometimes that's your quickest way to get back online. Now, this is changing. We'll probably see some regulations around this in the future. But if you if you talk to the FBI or any other law enforcement, they always say do not pay the ransom. They will just encourage more hacks. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of ransoms paid. So we have an industry level challenge that we have to address. We also have institutional challenges. We can't say this is just an industry level problem because as we get closer to home, there's there's institutional things that we individually can help to change. One is there's ownership ambig ambiguity across the hospital. Uh, one survey that we did uh, that's really well documented is we asked who should actually be in charge of cybersecurity in the hospital. And we have a big chart there. There's all kinds of answers ranging from CISO to IT, et cetera. But people like nurses, were somewhere between 89% of the time, people said nurses need to be in charge of cybersecurity ultimately. That's not true in any way, right? We want nurses to save lives and help people get better. They should not be the be all and all for cybersecurity, even if they're using those devices. So if we don't know who owns cybersecurity protections, we can't actually measure and judge and improve against them. We also know that there's in inadequate staff and funding. I've never been to a conference, I've never done a talk like this where I've asked, hey, who has enough team members and enough funding to properly secure your environment? You know, at best, I get a chuckle and someone kind of waves their hand uh, ironically. The reality is we've underinvested and undereducated team members in hospitals on how to properly protect against hackers. And we can't expect one or two person IT departments in a lot of cases to go and secure their environments against China and Russia and other nation states that are trying to take us down. So at the end of the day, we have to better improve the funding at the institutional level. And then of course, we have to look at the devices, right? Medical devices in particular are notoriously vulnerable. They have long life cycles. They're incredibly complex, right? Quite often we think of a device as a hard plastic shell and maybe a tube and a needle or something like that, for very basic terms. But in reality, they have multiple layers right down to the chipset of the network card out to that hard plastic cell uh, uh, shell. So we have to start thinking about all the components there and how they may put that device and the whole hospital at risk. So if you want to learn more about this, We've done plenty of other webinars on this. Um, we have a great white paper as well as a checklist on what these challenges are and where to go. You can find those at scenario.com.resources. So if you want more info, please let me know. But do know that there's three levels of challenge that we're facing now. We have to figure out how to address each one of those in different ways. So with that in a way, let's start talking a little bit about common exposure points. Because if we don't know how data is being exposed, we can't necessarily protect it. So first, we can always look at exposed EPHI and realize this is everywhere. And for reference, this data is coming from research that our team has done over the last two years or so, where we've worked with customers, we've worked with prospects, um, not only to secure their devices and segment the network and all the traditional stuff we do, but we've also looked at the flow of data to understand what systems are exposing patient data and how they're doing it. And the first system we saw um, were PACs. And I don't think this is a surprise because if you think about how a PAX is supposed to work, it's supposed to take a picture, an x-ray, whatever, of someone's knee, uh, like mine, you know, take that picture of a knee in northern Massachusetts um, and send it to Singapore, say, for a radiologist to, to review it very quickly. Um, from my point of view, it was great service. I had the x-ray of my knee back in, in the reading within a couple hours. I was amazed. Usually that's a one, two, three week thing. But because these systems are built to exchange information so quickly, one or two little flaws in them can open up a, a treasure trove of information that hackers would love. And in one case, our team actually found a magic URL. We were going through uh, an instruction guide that we found online of all places, and we saw that a URL was posted um, in a screenshot. We typed in that URL by hand, kind of tedious, but not didn't take too long. And by changing some basic parameters, we were actually able to get admin access to an entire PAC system. Now, the reality is we work with that PAX manufacturer to, to, to lock down the system, et cetera. But that's the basic things that hackers can do. Just that very basic information where data is leaked out can lead to massive data breaches. And it will expose things like EPHI, PII, and access to the data you shouldn't have. And because PAX systems store so much data, that it can expose them in the hundreds of thousands very, very easily. But it's not just PAC systems that are at risk. We also see things like CVIS systems, cardiovascular information systems, where in this case, um, they try to implement security through obscurity. Rather than sending data over a typical port, whether it be AD 443, what have you, um, they decided that they were going to send data over an unorthodox port, just a port that was open, 
unused, not reserved for any other uh, information exchange, and thought that just by changing that port, it would stop hackers um, from seeing the data transmit. Now, of course, any hacker with a few hours of training knows that they can just go there, go sit, watch traffic, or do a port scanner, and understand, hey, there's data flowing through port X, Y, and Z. And in this case, the data was at a lower volume, but because of how the handshake happened and getting access through that port, our team was actually able to go in and access the full database uh, within the CVIS without any credentials, which as you might imagine, hackers would love because it is, an, again, a very, very valuable source of information that they can sell in the black market. We also saw one that was really interesting around a smart whiteboard where if you think of a nurse's station, there's often some kind of whiteboard. Sometimes you write it by hand, but more and more frequently, you see digital whiteboards that tell you the patients, the room number, special treatment, et cetera. The problem that we found in one case was that the whiteboard had a web interface. And, and the typical whiteboard interface required login. It was well protected. But the web interface assumed access. It assumed that if you open the interface on, on your mobile phone, that you knew what the device was, where it was, and you should have access, which is obviously very bad. It didn't request any credentials. Never, ever do that. So we were able to actually go in and access all the data on the whiteboard without credentials. And you might think that would be 20 to 30 beds, but the reality is these whiteboards, unless you go in and explicitly delete the patient information, cache that information for decades, in some cases, or years at least. And in that case, we were able to pull again a few thousand records based on who had been in the hospital over several years. And then finally, and kind of most scary, is newborn RTLS systems. These are systems where a baby is born, the, the parents get a bracelet, kind of like a watch like I'm wearing today. They put it on the baby, they put it on the parents, um, and they kind of track you know, who the babies are supposed to belong to, to obviously prevent kidnapping. In this case, we were able to get direct telnet access to the servers where all that data was stored. And it was bad enough that we could actually access the data through telnet. Again, very, very basic uh, um, computer networking. But we were also able to go in and change the data and delete the data. And that gets really scary when you think about people that might be in the mindset to go and kidnap a baby, because if they have access to these systems and they can change the data, they could potentially add more confusion to a kidnapping situation. So these are the types of systems that if they have EPHI and all of these do, they can expose that data very, very quickly. And if you look at the numerous systems in healthcare environments, you start to realize not only are these everywhere, but a lot of other information is being exchanged by devices that you have to better protect. And so to do that, we have to start looking into improving those protections. I hope everyone is sufficiently scared into being curious about this now. So we have to think about first, where do we start? Because we can't boil the ocean at once. And this is where I have to jump back to roughly 2005 or so in the television show Scrubs. I love Scrubs. It's a great show. It's often considered one of the most accurate representations of what a hospital is. It's kind of funny, sad, all those things. It's not like ER where there's helicopters crashing and everything's flooding. It's more of a mix of emotions. And one of the things that Scrubs does really, really well is it introduces music in, into a lot of the shows. And they had this one show that had all kinds of, of musical numbers in it. I promise you this will all make sense, bear with me. And one of the best musical numbers in that show was a piece called Everything Comes Down to Poop. And the whole thing about everything comes down to poo is that everything going through your system when you can't diagnose something, if you take a fecal sample and you test it, you'll probably have a better idea of diagnosing what's happening in your body and the patient at that point, because it picks up all that information along the way. And where this relates back to EPHI is not necessarily the diagnosis, but we have to think about our hospital environments as one big body with data flowing through that. And we start to realize that all these devices are interconnected. They shouldn't be, but they are. All these devices are interconnected and they're exchanging data all the time. So we can't necessarily test all the data. We can't necessarily see it all coming and going, but we can look at the network traffic and understand what is happening and where that data is coming and going from, right? So in this case, we can see that there might be one device that's connected to every place. If we can put that in a central location and track that data, that's effectively the pool we want to look at. We want to go in, we want to see where patient data is, where it's flowing, maybe if it's going to Russia um, or Syria, probably not a good thing. And so if we start thinking about our healthcare networks as big connected environments that are telling us everything we need to know, we just need to look at those environments 
then we can start to solve the problem as a whole. We can take the network traffic, analyze that traffic in a very non-intrusive way, and it's going to tell us exactly where patient data is going and where we need to stop that flow. So if we look at the network traffic, it's going to tell us quite a bit, actually. And Tim, I'm going to have you jump in here a little bit and talk about what we're seeing, because most of this traffic is unencrypted. It has a lot of common exposure points that I talked about before. It's not properly authenticated. We can see data flow networks, and we can see the EPHI volume and type. So Tim, can you talk generally about healthcare environments and what we're seeing in them in terms of what network traffic will tell us? Sure. Uh, so obviously, a lot of medical devices, as you said, are non-encrypted. They're very chatty, but the the unique thing is there's a certain way they should be behaving, and we can pick up on the abnormal behavior. So we've been doing medical device security for a long time, but all of a sudden, wait a minute, why is this behaving in such a way? And then we start to see the EPHI, such as your use cases. Yeah, we're slanted towards the patient care, patient safety, but you know, back to the real-time location services of the uh, ba uh, baby monitors, those aren't actually medical devices. Those are IoT devices. So we're looking at all of it and we're able to figure out the data flow, how it's supposed to be behaving and we can pick up on those anomalies very easily along with the volume of EPHI. Yeah, great stuff. And if we look deeper into what's actually exposed there, there's a lot of information. So can you talk a little bit about the types of information we're able to gather from that analysis? Sure. So when we obviously pick up the device, we can identify pretty much everything about that server, what kind it is, where it is, what access point it's hanging off of, IP address, anything like that, open ports, what's going on from that regard. The EPHI, you can kind of see it in the EPHI types. There's a lot of different variables and a lot of different fields that trigger EPHI. And we've always identified it and said, yeah, this, this had EPHI, but it's the next logical step for us to turn around and look at it from, okay, we did medical device. Now we're seeing all of this. And to your point, you know, the ransomware and the fines, that's all related to the medical device, but now you're getting into the patient records. This is the next logical step for us to take because this is exposed. You've been hit, I've been hit, and they've taken this information because it's so accessible. Yeah, great points. And, and of course, whenever we're showing the information, and you can see a snapshot of, of our demo system here, but whenever we're showing this information, it's not necessarily that it's under attack. It's that we've identified points where hackers might go after. And more importantly, we're providing remediation and patch guidance. So it's not just like, hey, bad news, you have data that's exposed, good luck. We're going to provide you the guidance there. And this leads in really, really nicely to a question that I had uh, um, come in about 10 minutes ago. So Ted, I believe it's from, sorry for getting to you a little late, but he's a couple of really good questions. The first one is, um, how are attackers able to successfully attack? Where do they get in? Now, there's a couple different methods, but a lot of them start with phishing, right? A phishing email will go out, someone will click on it, that will get access to the environment. What happens after the attackers get access to the environment is where things get really wild. Um, sometimes they, they uh, send malware or ransomware in there, and that ransomware will uh, try to spread very noisily, very loudly. Um, a lot of ransomware isn't elegant. It's very effective. And if you know to look for it, you're going to see the signs of it very, very quickly. So sometimes they'll get in, they'll, they'll execute a ransomware attack. Sometimes they'll go in and they'll just look for, they'll just look for systems that are exposing data like we're talking about today. And their thought will be, I'm just going to steal this data and sell it on the black market. Increasingly, what we're seeing though is a combination of those two things plus one other tactic. Effectively, they go in, they spread a ransomware attack, they steal data, and then what they do is they shift from the techno technological side of the attack to the business side of the attack. They'll go to the hospital and say, we have 600 terabytes of data, whatever the big number is, and this many records. We're going to execute a ransomware attack, or we have already executed it. If you pay the ransom, we will not expose the data, and we'll get you back online as soon as possible. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If they don't pay the ransom, they'll fully encrypt the systems and the hospital will have to start recovering. They will also take those uh, those data records and they will sell them on the black market for somewhere between six and $50 per record. It, it varies quite a bit. 
The other thing they'll do, the third part of this attack that I mentioned earlier, is they'll actually go through and they'll look for famous people, politicians, actors, rich folks, whoever, who have their data in there, and they'll actually go to them with their data. They'll hold it out and say, if you pay us X amount, 50 grand, 100 grand, we will not release your private records. Um, if you don't pay us, then we're going to release them and you're going to be embarrassed. And as you might imagine, there's a very high rate of payment for those to save face. So I want to do a lot of detail there, but a lot of attacks still go through phishing. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. Um, another example that we have, I didn't mention earlier, but hospital robots, they're kind of about the size of, of, of a um, college refrigerator, a mini refrigerator. We found in some cases that those could be controlled by the outside world because the firmware on the robot was insecure. Um, the control panel, well, that was a web-based control panel, could easily be hacked um, through a very basic cross-site scripting vulnerability. Um, and those control panels were exposed to the outside world. They were just publicly available on the web. So in that case, it was very, very basic web hacking could get you access to an admin panel, which would give you access um, to over 40 robots in some cases, which was really, really dangerous. So we have a bunch more examples like this, but there are numerous attacks we've seen. They're not all phishing. There are other, are other ways into the environments. Um, and if you want any more other use cases, we have dozens we can share, of course. And so Tim, this is where I'm gonna hand it back over to you and let's do a little bit of a patient data security walkthrough. We've, we've hit on the finer points of what we do, but I want you to walk through the product itself uh, before you do, sorry. Other questions, if you have other questions, please ask them, we'll be more than happy to dive deep into them. But until then, Tim, off to you. Sure, so as, as we were talking about earlier, we've been doing medical device security for a while and we started to see this exposed EPHI where it's the magic link, uh, certain odd ports listening. And it started to make sense to us when we started looking at all the data and the records are actually going for more than credit cards now. And uh, Chad, as you mentioned before in other webinars, the other thing, ransomware, yeah, they attack you, they ask for money, but they might have another ransomware sitting waiting that they haven't triggered and they're gonna bring out in another six months. And what they're doing is listening for stuff like this, just like we've been able to identify. So this particular screen is just saying, we're gonna show you all the different EPHI systems in your network based on the traffic and what we're seeing. So you'll see it, it doesn't matter if it's on cloud or on-prem or in the cloud, but we can take this data and actually drive into each system. As you can see, we've uh, categorized it critical, high, low. So you can look at it at a recap, have enough information to decide which ones you should focus on. Uh, we're gonna look at the GE Muse because we're looking at all the different services. It has a high volume and it has sensitive EPHI. And remember everything we're doing is always patient care, patient safety, service disruption. We wanna make sure we're protecting the hospital as we do this. So if you click on the GE Muse for me, and what we're looking at is more details on this system. Right off the bat, this dashboard is giving you that the EPHI type that we're seeing is patient name, patient ID. We're also giving you the different risks. As Chad said earlier, we're not just identifying everything and just saying, okay, you got a risk, go take care of it. We're actually giving you action plans to how to eliminate it or reduce it. So we're helping you reduce this footprint, but now, the other thing you see is for an overview, six services, 25 clients, 11 data feeds. If you'd click on the services, we'll drill into this. And what we're doing is we're telling you, here's all the connected ports that we're seeing. You'll see the top one, it says it's encrypted. So yeah, we're, we don't know what's going on inside that packet. But look at the other ones where the 8080 is basic, basic authentication we're transferring eight records a day and it's a patient name, patient ID. But now if you look at the 9240, we're sending 2,500 records a day, there's no authentication and it still has that patient name, patient ID. So when you look at that, maybe you wanna focus on that higher port, figure out what's going on with that as well. If you click on the clients, we can look at the, the clients as well. And again, we're giving you all the information we can that we see all the connected devices. So when we talk about clients, those are the, the other um, servers or desktops 
connecting to the server and pulling this data. And again, we're telling you what kind of EPHI types we're seeing in every type of connection. What is it? Is the access type? These are all programs. These are all scripts that have been written. So they're doing it automated. And then we're telling you what VLAN we're seeing it. So maybe the VLANs were you might want to separate those VLANs and lock those down to help communicate and, and slow down that traffic. Lastly, if you look at the data feeds, what we're doing here is telling you how are they connected? What's going on with that? So these are all APIs in this case, but when you look at the, the top one, patients, obviously they're getting the patient name and patient ID, but the other one, that DLL or the, yeah, the, the status, it has no EPHI in it. So that's probably not a problem, but that DLL, they do have the patient name, patient ID, and there's 12 different parameters that they can plug in to get that data. So we're giving you everything that we're seeing on the network. So that way you have all the information to make that decision on how you want to resolve it. And then lastly, if you click on the risk for me, from the server side, as you guys probably know our system, we're identifying the risk, in this case, legacy systems, legacy OS, that's a prime target for ransomwares because they know hospitals can't patch it because it's certified for those that equipment that it's connected to. But what we're saying is, you know, performing uh, east-west segmentation and north-south to take care of that legacy OS. Again, if we can't eliminate that risk, we're gonna help reduce that risk. So that's from a, a server side and all the other supporting information is from a network side, trying to el eliminate the attack surface. All right, Tim, good stuff. Um, we had a bunch of questions come in, so buckle up because they're gonna test you. Uh, okay, let's start with this one. Uh, First of all, do you have to look at patient data when you're analyzing this data? Do you put patient data at risk at all? No, we're just listening to it. We're not sending it anywhere. It never leaves the four walls of the hospital. This is all metadata that gets sent up to the cloud. Great. Yeah, so never looking at patient data, frankly, hair color, eye color, doesn't matter here. It's more about the tags within that data and what is contained. Great. Uh, okay, next one. Does this impact network traffic at all? Um, not really, because they're already doing this. So since the way we're pulling this data, we're just a span off of a core switch and we're listening to traffic uh, from east-west, you know, side to side versus in and out of the hospital. So yeah, we're pulling this data and we're just getting a copy of it. So there is no impact and the systems are already operating. So there's literally no impact to how we're pulling this data. And I'll even say it's almost the opposite where a lot of times where we'll see either data exfiltration of someone's trying to steal gigs or terabytes or the spread of a ransomware attack, um, which uses the same core technology to identify it as, as this product. Um, we'll actually in our after attack kind of postmortem, we'll hear people saying, oh yeah, I noticed the network was running slow. Why is it? Well, it's because large amounts of data were being passed and, and exfiltrated. We don't have any impact, but we are able to say the network is performing poorly because of this attack. It's going to uh, help us avoid the attack and oh, the and network of course. Yeah. And not to take us off topic, but that's where our NDR picks up because we did have a, uh, a customer who had uh, a log for shell exposure. We've seen that they're trying to uh, get connected to that. And the very next thing we seen was large, large amounts of EPHI being exfiltrated from the hospital. It doesn't take rocket science to say, hey, this is wrong, and we help them stop that attack. Cool, good one. All right, next one is, how long does it take to detect the exposed data? Um, depends on how fast the, the devices are communicating. Uh, usually when we set up our collector, start listening to the network, if something is going on, it's usually within a couple of hours and we'd alert you that something bad's happening. But when we listen to all this, a couple of days to a week max, and it really depends on the communication frequency, should I say, of all the devices talking. We have some that have over a hundred servers that have EPHI, contain EPHI. That is critical for your HIPAA compliance officers because they don't realize, wait a minute, I have a hundred servers in my environment that have EPHI. It's something that's new to them because as when we were testing this, 
you know, as Chad said, we've been going through this for two years. And when we were beta testing it, people were surprised at where their data was and the fact that we can tell as much as we can tell just by listening. Yeah, and I'd love if everyone on this call could send this recording to your HIPAA compliance officers because they are spending lots of money and time and, and people auditing these systems. Um, and like Tim said, you can either spend a bunch of time debating which organization to go with, or you, you can just do the work very basically with this automated detection, which is good. Um, Tim, a couple more here. How long does it uh, take to fix the exposed data points? It depends on what they are. Um, we are focused on the critical risks. If you're talking about an east-west segmentation, uh, you know, as you and I know, we've been averaging six to seven weeks for implementation. Now, the industry says two to five years or whatever. We're not talking about in doing the segmentation project for the entire uh, hospital, the flat network. We're talking about selected items that will help you from a critical risk perspective of reducing that. Um, change of configurations, maybe a day, depending on the criticality and how fast the biomed team or the HDM team moves to resolve those for whatever reason. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that it can be. So sometimes it's a simple updating the IIS services. So the web server that's built into Windows, if they just patch that, that could be a 10 minute fix. It really depends on what those recommendations are. Yeah, a lot of the ones we talked about earlier, the examples we used earlier, a lot of those were simple configuration fixes. In some cases, they were firmware updates that required working with a vendor. That obviously takes a little bit longer. But in some places, it's just fit finding the window where the system be taken offline for a couple of hours and restarted after the configuration fix is done, or not even restarted in some cases. Um, and Tim, you hit, you hit on a point that I want to hit on too, which is a lot of security often battles the theoretical versus the practical, right? In theory, you should have defense in depth and you should have a team of 300 people that are well-funded going and doing everything with every tool in the world. Hospitals definitely do not have that luxury, right? It's very much a team of a small team that's underfunded and you have to get really, really practical really quick. So that's, that's what this dashboard um, is designed to do. Yep. Yeah. Okay. A couple more because we're getting some great questions. Um, who uses this the most? I, you know, I'll jump in here. We we mentioned the HIPAA compliance officers who are looking to secure data, but Tim, you know, as you're working with customers, who do you see use this functionality the most? Uh, from a patient data security, I'm, we're actually seeing the combined teams because the security team is interested in it now because there's fines associated with it. But the biomeds team is also interested in it because it's usually them who have to go and do the configuration changes. Cool. And then we have one more that takes us back to ransomware, which we mentioned earlier, which is um, how many other ransom events actually release the systems once they're paid? Um, so I'll change the wording there a little bit. You know, when an attacker goes in and they execute a ransomware attack and encrypt the systems, if you pay the ransom, how many are released? The reality is it looks like a high number actually stick true to their word. Um, simply because if they were paying, if you paid the ransom and they didn't release the info, then people would definitely stop paying the ransom. So a or lot of times- the fact that they can't hit them again. Yeah, or the fact they can't hit them again. So it looks like at least right now, the reason that ransomware attacks continue to repeat is because people know that they'll get paid if they release the info. Uh, I wish it was different. I wish it could, I could say these are evil attackers that never pay, never ever pay them, but they're actually pretty shrewd business people that know exactly how to find a path to revenue. Um, and it's important to say, these people are not intentionally trying to kill people. They're, they're not in business for that. They are in it to make money in healthcare um, has given them a very, very good revenue uh, stream over the last few years. Uh, and, uh, awesome. Yeah, go ahead. I had one more uh, revenue stream and you probably know this one by heart. Recently, uh, a hospital was compromised and they sent the request to all the patient records they had for everybody, not just the famous ones. So it's another revenue stream that they seem to be testing out and sending everybody and saying, we got your data, how much you pay in or pay this amount to get it back. Yep. And, and not everyone can be as lucky with me with weird knees and bad feet, because that's all the info that's in there. There's a lot of people that don't want their medical records out there. So um, yeah, it, it, attackers have found a good way to make money and we need to find a way to stop that. So 
with that out of the way, um, do know that we do have this whole patient data security product. We launched it just before HIMSS, uh, have been getting really good reviews and a lot of interest. We will go in, it's, it's incredibly lightweight, a very quick deployment with Tim and his team. Um, and effectively, we're gonna analyze that net network traffic in a not obtrusive way, or not intrusive way, I should say, um, to identify where data is exposed and help you secure it. So if you are interested in learning more, um, reach out to me at chad.holmes at scenario.com and we'll be happy to talk more about it. Um, now, if you are attending MD Expo as well, um, the M Hotel and Casino is a great venue. I went there for an event a couple of years ago. It's kind of like being in Vegas without having to be right in the middle of Vegas. Um, so if you kind of like Vegas for 24 hours like I do, uh, this event will be perfect for you. Um, our team will be there. I won't be, but others will. So feel free to stop by booth 210 and we can talk about this as well as how we're helping um, HTM teams increase their operational efficiency. So ho hopefully we can see some of you there. Now I did tease earlier that we have a little bit of a bonus topic. So if you do have questions, this is a great time to type them in while I go through this bonus topic. Um, but I wanna make sure everyone is aware that the HPH released new guidance around cybersecurity performance goals in late January. Um, I'll do the long and short of this, I'll summarize it. But effectively what's happened in healthcare environments is we've told hospitals that they have to implement better security, but we haven't necessarily given them a clear roadmap on what that means or clear instructions or clear guidance. And the HPH cybersecurity performance goals are an outstanding next step in saying, this is what you should be doing today. If you're not, you know, red lights are flashing, get this done. Those are the essential goals. And these are the goals you should start adopting as soon as possible, um, if not today, the enhanced goals. Um, so the essential goals are incredibly basic for a lot of teams. Things like email security, stopping phishing, multi-factor authentication, all these things that they're, if they're not in place will make you even easier to attack. Putting them in place will not stop the attacks. Nothing will stop them. It'll just make you a little bit more resilient. These are the low hanging fruit you have to go after. More importantly though, the enhanced goals really start to focus on where you need to start investigating, researching and budgeting today. Because hospital cycles, budgeting cycles are incredibly long as we all know, and decisions you make today may not be implemented for 18 months. We have to start thinking about what are we investigating today to implement as soon as possible. And these are things like improving insight into your asset inventory, not just your IT devices, but IoT, IOMT, OT, et cetera. Um, making sure that you have proper cybersecurity testing and mitigation strategies, making sure you're net, uh, segmenting your networks, which is kind of our bread and butter, um, making sure that you're detecting attacks or detecting exposed EPHI, which is exactly what we're talking about today. So if you haven't read these cybersecurity performance goals, definitely take a look. You can just Google HPH cybersecurity performance goals. Um, we also did a webinar on this about a week and a half, two weeks ago. So I'm happy to send that along to anyone uh, that hasn't seen it. But be aware of these, start taking a look at them because they are incredibly critical in giving you a roadmap on where you should, focusing, where you should focus your efforts. And with that, we've had a lot of questions, but I will open it up to any other questions that came in. Uh, Linda, have I missed anything? Uh, no, there's a few that have come in. Um, one that came in is, why do hackers actually target patient data? Yeah, so um, every, every answer about why do hackers do blank in healthcare almost always comes down to money. Um, could our lizard brains go to kind of the sci-fi of, oh my God, I'm plug uh, IV pump is plugged into me, they're going to overdose me. Unless you're the head of a nation state or you know someone really, really important or famous, that's not what hackers are going after. Hackers are going after records because they cost, again, depending on reports you read, anywhere between six and fifty to two hundred dollars. But when you're getting them in treasure troves of a hundred million records, or ten million records, I should say, that becomes very, very valuable very quickly. So at the end of the day, everything is driven by money. Okay, so leading on from that, are, are there any typical groups that you you see trying to steal the data? Yeah, they typically come out of Russia or China. Um, they're almost always um, for-profit groups. If you look at some of the case studies um, of groups that have been busted up or studied, um, they will be run just like a business. They have uh, HR departments to recruit both hackers and negotiators. Uh, they advertise, uh, they have professional negotiators to help negotiate rate, ransom payments. There's a bunch of names out there. Uh, most interestingly enough, the changed healthcare uh, um, attack 
was done by two different groups. One group um, kind of messed with the other and stole the $22 million ransom from them. That might be the only reason we know a lot of the details we do because the two groups are now fighting. So at the end of the day, they're just run like small businesses that are trying to make as much money as possible. Okay, so how long does it typically take to secure a system that's exposing patient data? Well, good question. And Tim, you, you touched on this a little bit. So can you give that answer again around, you know, does it take if, a day? If it's, hour? A, if it's a biomed fix, it's usually a couple hours, um, depending if you need to involve the vendor, which could take a couple of days. If it's more of a segmentation uh, solution, it's averaging six to seven weeks. So anywhere from a couple hours to six or seven weeks, depending on what type of risk we're looking at. Yeah, and the, the worst case we've seen was there was a firmware update that was needed where you had to, to go and deploy that to each physical device after the update was made. That was the big one. That took about three months, but still we're in a far better position now because we took the effort, not we. The vendors worked with us to take that effort a long time ago. So, so that time was well worth it. Okay, another question that's just come in. What are the things we need to be taking care of if we host the healthcare app in AWS, which has patient data shared between patient and doctors? That's a really good question. So I'll preface this by saying I'm a huge cloud proponent. Um, I would trust AWS or Azure or any other of the other major cloud providers I trust their security teams as much as I trust anyone else, just because they can invest in security and they've got to do as much uh, uh, um, security research and hire the best people as much as possible. And they have the budgets too. Um, further, if you look at the studies often funded by them, so take it with a grain of salt, um, but if you look at those studies, the breaches that result from using their services are almost never because their services get breached. So they're well over 99% are because there was a misconfiguration um, or there was some uh, issue in what was deployed on top of their services that caused the data breach. So the reality is it's more important to make sure the way you're accessing that data and the configuration of the systems they're using are properly configured and secured than, relying, uh, than, than being concerned about the underlying technologies they're providing. Tim, anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say a short answer is, you know, the hospital has uh, their connection to the cloud. Uh, if the people get in into the on-prem, they have access to the cloud. And, you know, when we look at all of this EPHI, we look at the, the communication to the cloud as well, and we're still going to give you ways to lock it down, uh, reduce that risk, reduce that footprint. But when they do come in through the on cloud or on-prem and go to the cloud, that's from the configuration the hospital did in the cloud, which supports what uh, Chad was just saying, is it's not AWS. They stand up the incident, the instance, and then you configure the security groups and what's allowed, and that's usually how they get in. And if anyone needs contact at AWS in particular, I, I work with Hector a lot, who is the, uh, one of their senior healthcare advisors over there. He can talk about security of the cloud and AWS all day, every day. I'm more than happy to give you his contact info. Perfect. And just before we wrap up, is there anything you would like to summarize briefly? For me, it's ultimately that there's a lot of patient data exposed. We're seeing new highs and we'll see new highs next year and for the foreseeable future a lot of this can be resolved or at least addressed and put us in a better security position it just takes action i know teams are overloaded um, but this is this is a quick win this is something that you can see a lot you can fix easily and you can predict a lot more patient data tim anything you want to say yeah um, besides patient data security you also want to look at the uh, medical device security they go hand in hand and you really wanna make sure that you're reducing this footprint because these attacks are not going away. I can almost guarantee you I'll be sitting here with Chad next year and saying they doubled again. Perfect, great. So as we come up to our hour, I'd like to thank you both for your time and for a great and informative presentation as usual. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the services they provide for the industry. So please visit scenario.com. And as promised, the answer to today's trivia question is the Easter Lily, of course. So congratulations to our winner, Laurie Clifford in Ohio. Sorry, enjoy your AirPods, Laurie. 
Just a quick reminder, you can obtain your C certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your 1C credit from the ACI, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back next week with another webinar and, of course, another 10th anniversary prize. So please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you once again for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope you have a happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone.